Hello, and welcome to Sobercast. We provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast format. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into the virtual basket. Also, if you're a member of NA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, NAPOD. NAPOD features NA speakers and workshops in the same format as Sobercast. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for NAPOD, N-A-P-O-D, all one word, on any podcast player app, or go to NAPOD.XYZ if you'd like to listen online. Hope you enjoy the podcast and have a great day. Hi everyone, I'm Pete from Alcoholic. And it sure is wonderful to be here. I enjoy being at any AA meeting. And uh, I had quite a tour coming here, as Dale told you, you know. We Indians, when we rely on a white man for a guide. And, uh, <laughs> I, I really never thought that day would come, but I, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking and all fun. We did have a wonderful day, and like I told Dale, my life is jam-packed today, and sobriety is just wonderful. And the times that I can get to myself, the times that I can get away, and the times that I can spend alone today, I, I, I treasure very much. And Dale gave me those times alone today, I'll tell you. And, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I think he was kind of apologetic for the scenic tour that we took getting here. But uh, really and truly, we, my wife and I, we did enjoy it, because like I said, our life is jam-packed. And I recall not too long, a year before I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, and I was living on the territorial skid rows of Detroit and in the streets and the alleys and the gutters and the garbage cans. And I had had one day to myself that I had came out and I said, it's Christmas Eve and I'm going to have a good time. And the first likely white man that came by that looked very prosperous, he wasn't prosperous too long. (laughs) And as a result, he was minus only $40 and I cussed him out for that. But I said I was going to have a good time, and as I went down into and got all cleaned up and deloused at Sally's, uh, I went down to to uh, the middle of Detroit in one of those good cocktail lounges, you know, and I was going to have myself a real drink, one that comes out of a bottle, a legitimate bottle, you know. And so I looked at myself, and I was having such a good time, and everybody was ho, 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 Merry Christmas, you know. And I, I, I knew that as long as I continued to tell Indian stories, these white people would hang around and buy me a lot of drinks. And, and the spirit was good, you know, and everything else. But I did happen to look in the mirror that was behind the bar. And, and, and as I did, I seen myself. And I seen how lonely I was, and I knew all the fun and all the joy that I was have, having at the moment would soon end, and I'd have to go back out in the streets. And I looked at myself, and I looked at myself two or three times, and I said to myself, and that image in the in the mirror, I said, you know, God, if there is a God, would you please just send me one person who would care? Just one person, that's all I'd like. Because I knew at that time I didn't have a single soul in the world that cared whether I lived or died. And so as I come to conference after conference, as I've been in this program, and I've talked over 4,000 times in and out of this country, and I look at the audiences, and I look, and my God, how many friends I have today. And I cherish every one of them because it's because of you that I am here. It was because of you that I was allowed to stay in this program. I wasn't too nice when I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was very scared. I knew I was going in to join a white man's organization and I never mingled with white people too much on a social basis. Unless it was under the influence of alcohol. And I was so sick that day as these two men led me into this thing called Alcoholics Anonymous. I had been shaken since 10 o'clock in the morning, and it was Monday, October the 13th, 1958. And as I walked up to the door of this meeting that I walked into, you know, they always had somebody at the door shaking your hand. And nobody ever shook my hand in a long time. And this bald-headed old gentleman, you know, (laughs) with blue eyes, took my hand and he shook it real hard and he looked into my face and he says, you're the biggest phony that ever walked through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous and I could have killed him right then and there. (laughs) Oh, he created a hate relationship for three years in this program of Alcoholics Anonymous. But he was wise. He was very, very wise. You know, he didn't let go of that hand because once he did, I'd have had him, man. (laughs) <laughs> and he took me down to this basement, you know, in this big church. 
And I walked into a room full of people. Now, maybe you white people can walk into a room full of people, but when I walked in as an Indian, I was so self-conscious. I hadn't had a drink since 10 o'clock in the morning, and I was shaking. And, you know, I was very self-conscious, but way from the end of the room, way from the end of the room came a voice that said, Hey, Indian, I'm glad to see you. I've been sitting here waiting for you for five years. And everybody turned around. I just shrunk right down. I could have killed him. But I was so glad to see him. He was a man that I used to drink with. And he looked so good. So very good. He had a suit on. I never saw the man in a suit. And his face was cleared up and he was smiling and he come running over to me and shook my hand. He says, yes, I've been waiting for you for five years. I knew you would get here. I says, how'd you know that? So many things he knew about me. And I was so scared at the time. And I was to ask him many things. For you see, it was at that first meeting that I got the answer that I needed. I got the answer that I knew I had been searching for for so long that I couldn't get anywhere else. And it was simply this, how do you get sober and stay sober? How do you get sober and stay sober for the rest of your life? And that's what I wanted when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. But I also, I also wanted to be happy. You know, show me a person today in this program of Alcoholics Anonymous that is not happy and I'll show you a person that is not working this program. If you've been around at least a week or two. Because they told me it was a one day at a time program. And I thought I was in the wrong place. And I asked that simple question I don't think is hard for anybody (coughs) excuse me to ask that simple question of what do I do? How do I get sober? I got that answer that first meeting. And you know how simple it was? Stay away from the first drink of alcohol and you'll never get drunk from alcohol in your life. Yeah, that's pretty simple. And we hear it over and over again in Alcoholics Anonymous and we take it for granted. I was in a prominent hospital not too long ago, a couple of years ago, because I had an alcoholic case that I, I was working with in that hospital and they a prominent hospital in Michigan. Well-known doctors came up with me and they called me aside and they said, Chief, what do you think of this? This is how you sober up the alcoholic. I took a look at their 16-page memorandum that they had on how to sober up the alcoholic. And I took one glance at it, threw it back at him. I said, it won't work. He says, what do you mean? How would you sober up the alcoholic, Chief? I said, stay away from the first drink and you won't get drunk from alcohol. (laughs) Oh, these brilliant men, let me tell you, their faces fell right down. For you see, none of them had ever heard this. We in Alcoholics Anonymous hear it so much that we take it for granted. The simplicity of Alcoholics Anonymous. I will guarantee you, you don't consume alcohol, you'll never get drunk from alcohol the rest of your life. And I, for some unknown reason, I believe these people. I believe them because many times after I had been in jail 50 times in prison, I came out and the minute I was released, five minutes later I was taking a drink asking myself, why do I do this? I'm a college-educated Indian. I got a lot of smart. I know my problem is alcohol. And I haven't touched it for 90 days, aren't I sober? Why would I go back to something like this? And I would look in the mirror and I would reach up with that double shot of old granddad and I'd ask myself over and over again, why do I do this? And then I'd go ahead and drink it, not knowing why. And I'd drink a few more and a few more. I remember getting out of the county jail at that particular time and a block and a half away was this cocktail lounge I was sitting at. And this was not a little after nine o'clock in the morning, you know. And I had been in this position many times by now. But I was young. And I looked at myself, why do I do this? Continue to drink. 
Somewhere around, I don't know, one, two o'clock in the afternoon, somebody caused a great disturbance in that cocktail lounge, and they blamed it on me. <laughs> and so I went back to my reservation around the corner called the Oakland County Jail. And I met all of my good friends, and they said, glad to see you, Chief, I'm glad you're back. The jail life became home to me pretty soon. And I was sick. And I passed out, and I slept that night, and I woke up in the morning doubly sick. And I knew at nine o'clock I was going to have to go over and see John. And that was the judge. Him and I were on first name speaking terms by that time. <laughs> and I was going to have to walk up to him again in front of his hall, high and mighty desk, you know, and podium that he looks down at you at. He picked up that big register on me, you know, and he started to go through it like that, and I'm standing there sick. I wish he'd get this over with, man. He shook his head, and he says, uh, It seems to me you just got out of jail serving 90 days, didn't you? I says, Yes, sir. Man, what I read here, he says, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to give you 30 more days. I took one look at him, and I was my bloodshot eyes, and I said, John, is that the best you could do? And I said, he says, no, make it six to get back, I went. <laughs> Who, me, an alcoholic? I'm too young to be an alcoholic. I'm too wealthy to be an alcoholic. I'm too educated to be an alcoholic. Besides that, I'm an ex-GI, I and mean, they need a, re a little rehabilitation, you know, a re little readjustment. You white people are giving me a bum break. You're picking on me. <laughs> so back in jail I went, but I had a little seniority in there. I actually didn't serve that 30 days. I think I went 11, they let me out again. But how many times had I came out and wondered and asked to myself, wasn't I sober? And I walked into that first meeting on the very first night, and you know what my sponsor said to me? Indian, if you don't take a drink for 20 years and don't consume alcohol, you're not necessarily sober. And that threw me. I didn't know what they were talking about. The outside world will call you sober if you don't drink. But not these AA people. I says, what do you mean? He says, Indian, you're suffering from a threefold disease called alcoholism. I said, whoa, back that up just a minute. Explain that a little bit better, will you please? And he said, let me put it this way. You're not only physically drunk, you're mentally drunk, and you're spiritually drunk. And when you start talking about being drunk, I know what you're talking about. You do have a soul, don't you, Indian? I said, yeah, I sure do. He said, did you know that alcoholism affected that soul? Affected that soul? Kidding. <laughs> Let's take a look at yourself for a minute and see what really happened. The first thing to go was my spiritual sobriety. And the second thing to go was my mental sobriety. And then I was into the bottle. It didn't happen overnight. It took a little bit of time, and the cleverness and the cunning and the baffling, powerful part about it is that alcoholism done this without me even knowing it. And now it began to make sense when I sat on that stool and asked myself, why do I do this? We have a last drink group that operates out of my home in Michigan, and let me tell you, the one thing we always ask everybody, how sober are you today on a basis of zero to 100%? And my sponsor says, you know, the answer to this thing, you know, Indian, he says, if you just stay away from that first drink, don't consume alcohol. He says, what does that really mean if you've got a threefold disease, you know? He says, you're a smart cookie, an engineer. I says, well, let me figure it out. And I took my calculus out and I said, oh, I've got threefold disease. Uh, I get one third of it. Uh, you know what that means? If I'm one third sober, I must be two thirds drunk. Oh, am I brilliant. Yes, I had the answer now. 
I knew why. He says, you stay away from a drink and don't consume alcohol. You're only one-third sober. He says, come in here and get a little knowledge in your head. Go to meetings, read the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and get a little knowledge in your head, and you might gain another 15% of sobriety. 15 and 33 and a third means what? Now, it comes the addition again. Still not 50%. He says, well... He says, what we're going to ask you to do is every single morning from this morning forward, you're going to get down on your knees and ask God for help to stay away from the first drink of alcohol. I don't believe in God. How fortunate and blessed I was at that time. This man drank with me. And he says, look at India. And he says, we didn't ask you to believe in God. We told you what to do. He says, lie to them like you've lied to every white man you ever drank with. (laughs) How blessed I was. And it made sense. It made sense. I says, is that all I have to do? He says, no, by the way, we happen to have 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, or 12 principles, of which you will apply in your life and take action on from this day forward every single day of your life. It don't sound like what I hear today in AA. They told me I do this program one day at a time, and I still do it one day at a time. It's much easier that way. And they said, you will reach a point of recovery and you will be a recovered alcoholic. So tonight I can say to you, I am a recovered alcoholic uh, many, many years ago. And I maintain my recovery one day at a time. I didn't come in and find a 90-day program. I didn't come in and find a 28-day program. I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous and I realized that this was only one day at a time and this is the last day I'm going to live. But it's going to be a sober one with the help of God in AA. And that's the way I was taught. And in my group, the last drink group of Alcoholics Anonymous, I trained my people. I trained my people to work all 12 steps every single day of your life. And I showed them how. And we teach them how. And we can take a written inventory every single day. And we can take a fifth step every single day. And I can make men's every single day. And I can ask God for help every single day of my life. It's not as big a job as you think it is. Or you want to make it to be. It's a one day program. And logically it seemed real good to me. And I didn't have to have an education to understand what they were talking about. Even though I was hungover and shaking. I realized one simple thing. I wanted to stay sober and I didn't want to drink again. And if they're going to, you're going to use one or two tools of this program of Alcoholics Anonymous and I'm going to use 12, who do you think's got the better chance of staying sober? (laughs) I see people come to this program, been in two or three weeks, and they haven't even written an inventory yet. I've written 10 this year myself and I'll probably do 10 more before the year's out. Because I know the value of it. I know what happiness it brings me. I know that it puts me in a condition that I can cope with life and be happy and excited about being sober. It's what you call a way of life. This way of life is one of the most exciting ways of life that you could ever walk into on the face of the earth. And I've been around this world two or three times and been in everything you can possibly dream of. I got in here to hear, to hear Jack tonight, this afternoon, deliver to you that it's There are miracles here. Every one of us are a miracle and we know it. Anything is possible with sobriety and the help of God. I know because it was performed in my life very shortly after I came in. And one of the greatest miracles that ever happened to me is simply this. Tonight, and for many years now, I can say to you, I love white people. You might not think so when I get done talking. (laughs) 
I came here to talk Alcoholics Anonymous because it's what got me out of a living hell, pushed me into a wonderful way of living, a living dream of miracles in heaven here on earth. Does it mean that life is easy for me? No. It means I've learned how to solve the problems of living. And I'm enjoying life to its fullest, one day at a time. Just one day at a time, and it came very quickly for me because I went to meetings. You know, they they hear 90 meetings in 90 days. If I'd have done that, I'd have been drunk. I went to 350 in 90 days. Two meetings a day, three meetings a day, four meetings a day. Day after day after day, and I never stopped for the first two years of my sobriety. And so by by just being there, I was bound to have learned something. But let me tell you something. I also grew very fast. And thank God for the teachers in AA that I had. Thank God for the living examples of sobriety that I had. And they weren't ashamed to admit it. And when you come to our group, I will guarantee you, you don't open your mouth until you tell us when you had your last drink of alcohol. And I can tell you tonight, my last drink of alcohol was on October the 13th, 1958. And I haven't had to lead this program, and I never wanted to lead this program since I've been in it. And I've never had to pick up or consume alcohol since then. Because I had good teachers. But I never thought so when I got here. And so I says, is that all you have to do? Just practice these principles of alcoholics? And I, well, they said, no. <laughs> if, if by chance you should get through a day of sobriety... Get down on your knees and thank God. Oh, here we go, that God bit again. Yeah, here we go, that God bit again, you know. And they didn't have the courtesy to even say a God of your understanding, you know. They just said, this is God. Oh, God bless those old timers. Let me tell you, when I came in, I hated them. <laughs> and you know, after you get sober for a while, you will too, you know. You realize where you're sitting, you know, if you're new in this program. Uh, <laughs> Don't kid yourself, thank God we're here, and thank God the old-timers were here when I got here, and I hope they're still around. I jumped these old-timers once in a while, and then I all of a sudden realized they'd call me one of those things. (laughs) But you see, they gave me the answer that first night. And the second night, I went to a closed meeting. When you know when to close meeting, they sit around and talk, you know, and they tell such beautiful stories, you know, and I listen to all of them, you know, and... And I'm sitting there, a new man still shaking, you know. And it finally came to me, I, I felt discriminated against. They waited for the last one, you know, and then they called on me. And, of course, the boss was leading the table, that bald-headed old geezer, you know. Uh, and way down the end of the table. And he looked at me and he said, Sonny boy. <laughs> God, I hated that name. He, he said, Sonny boy, he said, do you have any questions? Ah, boy, was I waiting for that one. I said, yes, sir, I certainly do. I've heard you white people talk about a lot of wonderful things about this thing called Alcoholics Anonymous and your sobriety. But the one thing I haven't heard is when did you have your last drink of alcohol? That's what I came here for. That's the name of the ball game. And I pointed my finger at the guy across the table from me, and I said, You, buddy, how long has it been since you had a drink? And he said, Three years. And I said, Wow. And I went to the next one, and he said, Seven years. And I said, Wow. And I pointed my finger at my buddy, and I said, How long has it been since you had a drink, Arnie? He said, Five years. Wow. I halfway believed him. I drank with him. I knew how bad he was. I couldn't believe it. And that was only natural because, you know, after all, I was raised that all white people lie. You know? And so when I come to Alcoholics Anonymous, I wasn't about to believe you people. I wanted to know if this thing was true. I wanted to know if you were telling me the truth or not. And what's the easiest way to do that? Alcoholics are blabbermouths. Ask a few questions. And I continued down the line and I saved the best for last. That bald-headed old geezer down in the tail. You know. I looked at him and I said, old man. 
How long has it been since you've had any alcohol? And he was short, bald-haired, blue-eyed. And he got up on his haunches like this at that table, looked down the table at me. And he said, Sonny boy, I haven't had a drink in 11 years. And one look at you and it's going to be 11 more. <laughs> God, I hated it. <laughs> Oh, did I hate that man. <laughs> Anytime he was at a meeting, I would be there at the front row and I had my paper. I used to always write notes at meetings, you know, when I first came. I had my paper and I'd write everything down he was saying, you know, because I was going to nail this joker one way or the other. <laughs> they gave me this big book to begin with and they told me, this is where AA is. This is where you will find the truth of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. And so when he started to speak, I would take these notes and I'd go back to my little room and I'd start to find out. My God, I couldn't find out if he told me a lie at all. And so the only way to find out if people are really telling you the truth, have them investigated. Like I said, hey, he's a blabbermouth. Hey, I'd go around, where were you born? Who was your mother and father? Where did you go to school at? What city are you from? I think it's all down notes. And I got it off of all these seven men, you know, and I took it to my lawyer and I said, here, get me everything on the, that you can on these men. Two weeks later, he came back with a stack of papers this high. And now I had them, boy. I looked through there, you know. Couldn't find a single lie. I had found seven white men who I knew told the truth. <laughs> and I was going to hang on to them for dear life. It may not mean much to you white people, but for me as an Indian, you have to remember I was brought up that way. And so I thought I had found the answer. Today I know I did. And I hung on to these men very closely. And as Arnie took me away from that meeting, my sponsor-to-be, who I drank with that night, you know, I looked at him. He had a suit on. I had never seen him with a suit. He had money in his pocket. His money. We, we walked out of the meeting and we went to a brand new car, his car. We had many cars when Arnie and I drank. <laughs> but this was his car. And as I got into his car and we started to walk away, he was going to drive me back to the little room that I had acquired that day. You know, I noticed something and very strange and he began to talk about God. Not the way we used to talk about God, you know. And I would look at him and I marveled and, and I couldn't put my finger on what was really wrong. And then all of a sudden I discovered what it was. He smelled like soap. <laughs> he was clean. You gotta remember, I just came out of the territorial skid rows of Detroit and just crawled out of a garbage can and hadn't had a bath in three months. I wasn't used to smelling people who were clean, let alone recognizing what soap smelled like. And he was to tell me many, many things, but this was my beginning. This was the start of something beautiful, and I knew it. And I had to go back and find out what happened. And I'm still coming back. This was the beginning. This, and I hope I never forget. Because today, you see, we all end up a little different in our drinking career and in our degree of alcoholism in order to get here. But I will guarantee you, every single one of us started out the same way. We picked up that first drink someplace along the line. And if you were like me, I don't know. But I will guarantee you, when I picked up my first drink of alcohol, I never said to myself, if I go at this thing hot and heavy for about 15 years, I can join AA. <laughs> no way! I didn't come in here on a winning streak, I'll guarantee you. And although I had called AA, I didn't get in here by myself. There was no place else to turn 
I had tried everything possible at that time, and there was no such thing as treatment centers then. And I had gone to doctors. I had gone to men of the cloth. I had gone to psychiatrists. Oh, they're cute. I, I love psychiatrists, you know. I went to them every week, every single Monday, you know, after you get off that alcoholic weekend, you know. And the best thing to do is go to a psychiatrist. And I went to him and paid him $40 every week for some brilliant information he used to give me. And you know what it was? He says, the trouble with you, young man, he says, you're an American Indian. Now, if you only stay off of the hard stuff and stick to beer and wine, you will be all right. And oh, did I love him. I paid him $40 a week to tell me that. Well, I eventually got back in jail, and I figured he wasn't doing me too much good. Through my religion, they told me I had to find Jesus Christ and go to church every single day, and I would be all right. And I followed instructions right to the letter, and it's the longest time that I never drank prior to coming to AA, and that was nine solid months. And I was the most miserable Indian you would ever see in your life. Crawl up the billboard sign, tear down the beer ad, and want to drink the thing right there. You know. Oh, God, did I want to drink. I don't want that kind of sobriety. I want what I've got today, and I'm happy about not drinking. I'm happy about this life that God has allowed to me to stay on this earth. 27 years longer than I should have. But more important, he has performed miracle after miracle in my life. And you're going to hear about him a few of them later. But I'm going to backtrack now just to let you know who I am. Because a lot of times I get such a kick when I do get dressed up. I hear so many lovely remarks from these white people that I travel among. <laughs> I got one tonight. They're all sincere, I assure you, and I know that today. But I did have one lady come up to me tonight and say, Are you a real Indian? I don't know. Maybe I am or not, you know. No, I am the heredity chief of the Ottawa Chippewa Nation. I am the great-grandson of Chief Blackbird, one of the last heredity chiefs of the Ottawas in the state of Michigan. And I had a lot to learn about my own past, a brilliant history. And I'm very proud of it today. I didn't become so proud of it until I sobered up. I have many responsibilities as an American Indian. I was adopted early in my life, you know, and I was given a Christian name when I moved into the white world, and I hated that ever since. Not too many years ago, I went back into the courts of Michigan to retain, regain my own name of Blackhawk, of which I had at that time, you know. And I went up to the judge, and when I went up to the judge, he says, What's your first name? I said, I wasn't given a first name. Indians aren't given first names. They only got one name, and that's Blackhawk. He said, well, you're supposed to have a first name. I said, who means I'm supposed to have a first name? He said, well, what do they call you? I said, they call me chief. But not only that, it is actually my title in the tribe today. I'm a heredity chief of the Ottawa Chippewa Nation. He said, okay, we'll put that down. So legally speaking today, if you look at my drive license and birth certificate and all my legal papers and everything else, my first name is Chief Blackhawk. That's my full legal name today. And I get such a lot of fun out of it, but I am proud of it. Since I sobered up, uh, uh, I kind of travel around the country a little faster than maybe I should. And every so often, those little boys in blue pull me over. <sighs> And I get the biggest kick out of myself and I hand them my driver's license and it says, Chief. They don't know if I'm a chief of police or an Indian chief, but they just say, well, Chief, take it easy from here on in. <laughs> but I am proud of it today and I do appreciate all questions that do come to me. And I am coming out with a couple of books very recently. We're leaving here for Newark, New Jersey with a copy of my first book coming out and uh, on this Tuesday morning. And uh, we're going to spend some time there. And I'll come back into town on Thursday and go out to the, take the lead at the state conference in North Dakota, Bismarck, North Dakota this week. So we are kind of busy and jam-packed. And thank God for that. Thank God for it. 
I came from a family and I was adopted early in life by my own aunt. I didn't know that, but they were both Indians. And pretty soon they got divorced, and I went to a boarding school. And there was drinking, there was fighting. Pretty soon Dad married another Indian, so out of the boarding school they come, went back, and they all knew each other. They stayed together even though they were divorced. And Dad got married again, so I had a new mother. And pretty soon there was a drinking and fighting, and pretty soon I'm back in the boarding school, and every time I went back to boarding school, I knew what that meant. And then pretty soon Mother got married to a Passamaquoddy Indian way out in Maine, and by gosh, I had, back I went to live with her, you know. And the drinking and the fighting and everything else, you know. And pretty soon I'm back in the boarding school again. Dad got remarried again. He married uh, right not too far from here, a Seneca Indian from Cattaraugus Reservation in New York here, near Buffalo. And so I went back to live with Dad again, you know. And, well, to make a long story short, before I was eight years old, I had four mothers and four fathers. <laughs> you know? and, and that leads to a pretty mixed up little Indian, I'll tell you. But I was taught, they all loved me, they all knew who I was, they all knew what I was to be brought up as, and, they, and I think it was to my advantage because I had four mothers and four fathers who really loved me and contributed to my education. Because you see, in my family, education was the main thing. To get along in the white world, you had to have a very good education. My father was bound and determined that I was going to become the best. He had some very unique ways of teaching me to become an all-A student in school. For every time I came home with that report card, you know, and there wasn't an A on that report card, you know, Dad and I had a little powwow back in the boiler room. <laughs> and he came out with that little strap, you know, and for every mark that was under an A, I got it right across the back. And then came the lecture. He said, son... You go to the same school, you got the same amount of time, you got the same teacher as those white people. The only trouble with you is you just don't study hard enough. And whap, I get it. And now I'll tell you something. It don't take too long to be influenced to be an all-A student. I don't recommend that today to anybody. But that's the way I was raised. And that's the way some teachers remember me as. Because, you see, I think I kept more teachers after school trying to explain to them why I should have an A- minus rather than a B plus. <laughs> you know? And I kept them after school many times. But I did study hard, and I began to like it, and I became an all-A student. And by the time I reached high school, I knew exactly what I was going to be. I was going to be an aeronautical engineer. I was going to go to Michigan State College. I was going to have a lovely wife, a good home, a good position in the world, and nothing in the world was ever going to stop me. And I was out to get that. And I didn't think anything in the world would ever stop me, neither. And I graduated, and I got engaged to a lovely young girl at that particular time. And I went to Michigan State College, and everything seemed to be going my way, and I was getting everything I wanted. The top man in my class, wherever I went, and all of a sudden, boom, December the 7th, 1941. And I was taught to love my country. And I still do love my country. And I left Michigan State College to go into the service of my choice, the United States Naval Air Corps. Now, when I first came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I used to say my drinking never gave me any problem until I came home from the service. But I became a little bit more honest. My memory came back, and I remember quite a few things that happened in the service. I'm not going to bore you with my World War II service life. It wasn't that exciting. I only spent 37 months in combat overseas in the Pacific. I shot down twice, and that was the extent of my big battles. I was a flying as a combat air crewman and heavy bombers over the Pacific. I think what's important that did happen overseas was my first drink. And I remember it so vividly. You see, up to this point in my life, I didn't like anybody who drank. I would not associate with anybody who drank. Those who drank were unintelligent people. Because, you see, I had learned a long time ago that alcohol gets into the bloodstream, alcohol will go to your brain, alcohol can drive you insane, and alcohol can kill you. But I'm too smart of a cookie, and before it does that to me, I'll quit. And so I remember these guys used to go out, and the alcohol wasn't overseas yet, and we were in between flights, and they would go out... And man, they would play cards and all night long and get drunk and they would come back and disturb everybody. And I wanted no part of them and I loved to gamble. And so one day a guy said to me, he says, Chief, you don't have to take a drink. How, how ironic that was. 
Because when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, my first night, a man said to me, from this day forward, you don't have to drink. That bell rang to me when I got into Alcoholics Anonymous and took me back to that first drink. And I walked into that tent area, you know. Somebody poured me a glass of water and handed me a glass of water that looked something like this, only it was in a clear glass, you know, and they said, here, chief, have a drink. Oh, wow, did it burn. <laughs> I could feel it going all the way down. Tears came to my eyes. Did you ever see an Indian give smoke signals out of his ears? Whee! Wowie, wooey, I'll tell you, I loved it. I loved drinking. I loved the warm feeling of alcohol. I immediately became and fell in love with alcohol. But I got sick and drunk. <laughs> I don't remember how I got back to the sack. And I woke up in the morning, and you know, I was so sick. I had never been sick like that in my life. And you know what? I didn't realize that I was going to do this to myself at least 10 or 20,000 times more. It never dawned on me that my pursuit of alcohol wouldn't have this happen to me some more times. I was so sick that day. I was on Guam, and my God, I couldn't even eat breakfast. I had some cough, couldn't even eat dinner. I had some more coffee in the afternoon, you know. Uh, they had that uh, stuff on the shingle. Um, uh, <laughs> I must have a few SGIs here, you know. <laughs> but, but I love that stuff, you know. And I, I got some of that down. I got some more coffee down. And after dinner, some guy said, Hey, Chief, you want to go play cards tonight? Zingo! I'm about the first one ready to go. Man, I just pursued alcohol with every vim and vigor in my body from that day forward. I learned to drink it. I learned to handle it. It made me feel good. I had found the answer to living. I could tell the admiral to go to hell if I wanted to, you know. I could talk to anybody. You know, this was real wonderful. I felt so good. Alcohol gave this to me. I felt like a giant. I could have whipped the whole Japanese Navy all by myself. Lies. What a brilliant student I was when alcohol began to teach me. I didn't know that my language is about to change. I didn't know that I was going to start to use an altogether language composed of little beautiful four-letter words. Never used those in my life. But I did find something nice and amazing. I didn't have to go to church anymore. I didn't need that stuff anymore. I didn't need to be honest. I could lie. Oh, in the beginning... Little white lies, you know. And they became whiter and whiter and whiter and whiter. As alcohol taught me to be very good in this field. Very dishonest. Like I said, I was a brilliant student. I learned fast and I learned quick. To give you a kind of an idea, when I came home from the service, I had $28,000 over and above what the Navy paid me. But what had also happened there at that particular time, let me tell you something, this little girl that I was engaged to, all you white guys, you know, you were getting those Dear John letters overseas. The, the girls were getting married out of them, you know. And I said, good. No white man knows how to pick out a woman anything. But me, I'm an, I'm an Indian. She'll wait for me. Besides that, look what she's getting, you know. She wouldn't dare. And so I was sitting on the right band one day, and I got that proverbial here John letter. And I remember I was in a position to be covered up, and I had alcohol to fall back on, and I went down to the seashore and looked across at Kenyon, and I began to drink. And I think the bitter hatred toward the white people was instilled in me a little bit stronger at that particular time. And it was one of those times that you could drink and cry and drink and cry. You ever get in that position? Not get drunk, just drink and cry, drink and cry. And then I was to come home. After the war, I was very bitter. Very, very bitter. And it was my turn. Look what this country has done to me. I've given it the best years of my life. And oh, you talk about resentment. And you talk about hatred. It was fun time. And I was the master. And I was going to have fun. And I had plenty of money. 
Well, that's exactly what I did. I came home, I started to drink with the crowd, and the boys coming home and everything else. But pretty soon they began to disappear, and I, I didn't know where they went to. And pretty soon my father got on me about going to work. Oh, what a nasty word. <laughs> and I figured, well, the money was running low, and maybe I'd better go to work. So I got a job. Through my acquaintances that I had been drinking with. A very, very well-paying job. I became an insurance agent. Because you want to know why? All insurance agents are rich. They make lots of money. And they buy big cars. And they got lovely women around them. And they don't have to work. So I became an insurance agent. My folks believed I was an insurance agent. Every place I went, they believed I was an insurance agent. All the fellows in the country club see my card that I was an insurance agent. And when you got right down to it, I was in the banking business. After 12 o'clock, midnight. I became very good. I needed $150,000 a month. One night's work ain't too bad. I was good at my trade. I traveled the criminal world in Detroit for a long time. And it was a period of my time that I didn't drink, because you don't drink in the criminal world. You walk a very tight line if you expect to be successful. But one night I got drunk and they wouldn't let me go on one of the biggest trials we had going. And when I woke up I found out that they had been contacted by and sent to Jack to prison. And if you don't think that looks good, I didn't take a drop of alcohol for crying out loud for two days. <sighs> I got connected with another organization and I continued, but I was scared I had to hire a bodyguard. I was stepping on a few toes and if you've ever led this kind of life, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's not an easy life to lead, it's a tough life. Yes, I had a lot of money. I had a lot of really good. And I traveled a bad circle. But I got scared. Full of fear. I could trust nobody. And for the first time in my life, I said, there must be something wrong with me. What's the answer? I know the answer. I'm not married. Married people don't get into these kind of situations. And so I looked up a young girl that I went to school with. Our family grew up together and, and she came from one of the wealthiest families in Detroit and I decided I was going to marry her. And I started to go out with her but I had one big barrier. My future mother-in-law. You know, in the land of the very rich, when you are going to join the clan, you have to pass the examination. You have to be approved. You have to be accepted. And generally, there's a patriarch or matriarch of that family that you have to pass inspection on. And mine happened to be my future mother-in-law. And she was one of those very old, old, old German women. And she came from Billings, Montana. And for some unknown... Well, let me give you a pretty good idea. What our relationship was, I tried my heart. I bought a bonbon, chocolate, roses. I even kissed the old bitty one. Mm -hmm. Our relationship was something... Did you ever look at anybody and smile at them and they smile back at you and you hate each other? God. That was kind of our relationship, you know. But she didn't have the advantage of al and of course, by this time I'm a practicing alcoholic, although I didn't know it, you know. And she said one simple thing to me that turned the whole tide of events. And that was she says, well, okay, you can't marry my daughter. You tell an alcoholic he can't do something and you see what happens. Two weeks later, we were married. Brilliant father-in-law, loveliest father-in-law in the world. Give me a $85,000 home, a place in his business, one of his cars, you know, and the membership, membership in the private country club. Hey, we had it made. And she had just come out of finishing school. Two young people, for crying out loud, that had the world by the tail and we should have gone a long ways in this world. Except for one thing. I continued to drink. Oh, I covered it up many times. It wasn't too unusual. How could I be an alcoholic? 
And so that marriage was doomed right from the beginning. But one lovely thing did happen. A lovely little boy was born to me. And I was so proud of him. His name was Little Hawk. You'll read about him in my book. And I went through a long divorce proceedings over the custody battle for my little boy. And I remember when these white people took him from me. And I cried for three hours and you couldn't stop me. Until the day I die, I will remember his tears. And you still could not tell me I was an alcoholic. That drinking was interfering in a normal way of living in my life. You rotten white people, I'll get even with you yet. I don't know how. And the bitter hatred grew and grew and grew. I went back to college. I went back to uh, uh, Electronics University. Studied real hard. Didn't seem to be getting anywhere. This wasn't my answer. Korean War broke out, and I went back into the service for another hitch in the United States Navy. And it didn't take too long after I was in before I was up in front of the old man. I was in trouble. He looked at me, and he says, Indian, he says, I don't know how you ever got that good conduct medal. And how many times was he to tell me that? All through my second hitch, I was in trouble. Before I was to re-enlist, I just got done doing 45 days in the Marine brig. And when I came out, I knew I would never make 20 years. And I had 10 in now. The year was 1952, and I was to come out of the service again. And I was to meet you lovely women. I just love you who fall in love with the alcohol. A beautiful little blonde. Our families had known each other. But all of the things that had happened to me, she knew, the family knew, and yet she fell in love with me. And you know what she said to me. You know, Chief, I know you won't drink so much if we get married. Oh, did I love to hear that. Man, I thought that was great, you know, and so I decided to get married again. But basically, really, I knew she was in love with me. But what I got married for was just simple reason she was working and I wasn't. <laughs> At this point in my life, I would go to any extent to get a drink. Around August of that same year, I'm walking down the street. I don't know what's happened. My wife hasn't been around. And I see her across the street. I run across the street, tap her on the shoulder. And I say, Dee, when are you coming home? And I'll never forget the look that she gave me when she turned around. And she says, Walter, don't you know we're divorced? You don't think that don't knock you in the ear. Tell you something much better. I've been sober 27 years, come this October 13th, God willing, and I can't tell you anything more today about that second marriage and what I just got done telling you. Well, it don't take much brains to figure out, and I knew very well alcohol had me whipped and I didn't care. If I'm going to be an alcoholic, I might as well be a good one. And so I proceeded to drink. Built big businesses, lost them all, then pretty soon I was unemployable. I ended up on a territory of Skid Rose in Detroit. If you've lived there, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, I could talk all night and you still wouldn't know what I'm talking about. And I don't think that's really important. Thank God you young people don't have to go down those kind of roads today. Thank God our message is being carried. Because you see, when I came in, I was the only young person in the group, and I was the youngest person in the group. And I looked around, and all I could see was bald heads and gray hair. And I, my God, what have I gotten myself into? They're over the hill. They should be here. They've had their fun. And they're going to take me with them. <laughs> is that all my life is going to be amongst old people? The message has been carried. Thank God. Miracles began to happen. Came out of jail for the last time in October 13, 1958. Was rolling around and I'd done something very strange. I got up that morning at 10 o'clock and I was going to have two beers. Checked my finances over. I had just gotten out of jail. Got a six pack of beer. I was going to nurse it till the working stiff got off and left enough entry fee so I could get in and I'd be good till 2.30. What a brilliant outlook on the future. As a young man, 
Colin Church is here to give you quite a pass. And I done just that. I went and got those two bottles of beer, uh, two glasses of beer, went around the corner and got a six pack, started to walk across the street, and I threw them down. And I said, that's the end, and I went into my last blackout that I've ever had up until this night even. And when I came out of that blackout, I was on the phone and some woman was screaming on the phone, this is Alcoholics Anonymous, are you having trouble with your drinking? And do you want to quit? I said, yes, I do. She said, well, you'll be all right until tonight. And we'll have two gentlemen call on you. And I had just declared a room. And I said, yes, I'll be all right because I'm going home. I never learned something so much in my life, and I never used the word in my life. A few folks have allowed me to have a home for people on you. And I can feel the same. People say sheep that are used to you. I hope that God you can pay me to use me for the day I die. I thought I was so brilliant in ten years of program on my own. You know, I did find a God in this program, a God of my understanding. And I know that day, that day that that phone call was made, I didn't make it. I'd like to look at it today that my God looked down at me and he said, Indian, I have opened the door for you so many times and you never went in. This time I'm going to kick you in and see if you stay. I got off of the phone and I had the same 60 cents that I had before I got on the phone. There was no phone directory. I hadn't even heard of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I didn't see anybody around me. And so that night, these two gentlemen at 7.30 came knocking on my door. And I peeked out of that alcoholic home. You know, that alcoholic home when the shades are down, you peek out, see who comes. Two men with white, sh- white shirts and ties on and suits on and a brand new car. And I ran to the back end and I told the landlady, see who it is, I'm gone. Because I know what it meant when two guys came to my door with white suits and ties on and a suit on and came in a nice car. I had had that happen many times. And so she opened the door and I'm in the kitchen listening. And they said, we're from Alcoholics Anonymous. We heard there's somebody here who wants to get sober. I said, let them in. I was so relieved, I was so thankful, and I don't know what much they said, but they said, we're meeting starts at 8 o'clock, are you ready to go? And I said, I'm ready. And I wouldn't care where they took me. And I felt even a little uncomfortable as I got into the back seat of their brand new car. And they took me to that first meeting I described earlier. And I found my answer. I found my answer that night, and I knew it. And I was to travel a very tough road from there on in. Alcoholics Anonymous is a tough program. It's not an easy program. It is a simple program, but it is not easy. And that's why you are proud and you are proud that you're sober tonight. And you are well knowing of the fact that you are each miracle today because you are not drinking today. And if you're new in this program, this can be yours from today. You don't have to pick up a drink, and you can walk into the light again, and you can be happy, and you can be sober. Because you've got people who care, you've got people who are going to lead the way, you've got living examples who will reach out to you and show you the way. i talked to many people who have been in, in, oh, I don't know if in your group they go out and drink again. And I have heard so many people say, let them come back. Let them come back on their own. They know where the program is. <coughs> They're not ready yet. I don't know what kind of a God you got, but I don't have that kind of a God. He tells me to go get them. He tells me to help the suffering alcoholic and the suffering alcoholic got out there dying and you should know that call as well as I do and you should know that feeling as well as I do. Do you think it's easy to come back to this program by yourself? Go get them. 
My God tells me, go get them. And I go and get them. They may not stay, but I go and get them. I die every time I go out to see the suffering alcoholic. But my heart goes out to them because there is nobody in this world that is helpless. There is nobody in this world that is hopeless. In my eyes, who is suffering from the disease of alcoholism. And my God tells me that I have to go. It is my salvation. That's the kind of God that I have found in this program. And he began to perform a lot of miracles in my life. Because I got back on the road and I got my first car and I was taken off the road never to drink, never to drive again and it was a marvelous feeling. I got a nice place to stay and I finally got a job and I could go to work and stay on it. And all along these people in Alcoholics Anonymous nursed me along. They fed me. They housed me. They took care of me. They tolerated me. I sat at meetings with a 25 in my lap and I was going to blow the head off of any white man that ever lied to me. And they allowed me to stay. But they did convince me to put the gun away. (laughs) I got in fights. One guy said to me one time, all you have to do is come in this program and do anything you want as long as you don't drink. Oh boy. (laughs) I reached across the table, I grabbed that young man and boy, I let him have it. I jumped over the head table and put my foot in his face so a little blood came. And by that time, six AAs grabbed me and they said, Hey, what's the matter? What are you doing? I said, Did you hear what the man said? He said, I could do anything in this program I wanted to as long as I don't take a drink. And I haven't taken a drink. And I don't like his face. <laughs> no, I wasn't nice when I got into this program, but I learned and they tolerated me and that's what I'm deeply grateful for. They allowed me to stay. Such weird people in AA. After I got done smashing that guy's face and you know what they said? Keep coming back. Ooh, you gotta be crazy. <laughs> but I learned and I grew. And I'd done everything I was supposed to do, even though I didn't like it. And I began to grow very fast. And one of the greatest miracles that ever happened to me, I once was given again, given the privilege of being called a hustler. For a little girl walked into the program whom I had sponsored her brother. And she was only 23 years old. What a sick little puppy. And I felt so sorry for her, and I couldn't get a woman sponsor for her, so I ended up sponsoring her. And you know, I am still sponsoring her. We just celebrated 25 years of a very happy marriage, and we're going strong yet. She's right down in the front row here, and she just celebrated 25 years of sobriety in this program this last June 19th. Take a stand, honey. My God has been good to me. And I hope I never forget it. I don't want you to ever forget that alcoholic that leaves this program. Because I just recently lost somebody who was very dear to me. I have got a lesson in grief. I cried. I grieved my eyes out for six solid days until I got my answer from God. This little red-headed girl my wife and I were sponsoring with my photographer who's contributed it to my book coming out was very good in the program for a long time and left it after six months. And I never left her all through her last drinking. She passed away because she couldn't keep this program working in her life. And she was 29 years old. A beautiful, brilliant photographer. I cried. And I cried. And it hurt. And I asked my God, will you please let me know she is all right? On a Sunday night after she had died on Tuesday, I woke up at 4 o'clock in the morning 
because I had seen a vision. A vision of this beautiful redhead running away from me in the black corduroy pants that I seen her in so many times in a beautiful blue sweater. She ran toward that warm light that I've heard so many people describe as they run toward God. And she never turned around. And pretty soon the picture went out and some brilliant golden letters started to appear. And they appeared very vividly in a verse that scared me. And I woke up and grabbed a pencil. And I started to write the words that I had seen. And I went back to sleep. And I grieved no more. I cried no more. I'm going to close now by sharing that vision that I had seen on that night. I have called this farewell to a sponsor. My God, my God, did she arrive okay. For you allowed her to stay such a short while. But the treasures and pleasures she shared each day were created with her camera and a beautiful smile. When faced with a situation she could not see, I would always hear a familiar, Chuck's a Rooney, it's only me. My God, my God, please let me know, is Nancy okay? For in her own way she has found peace, serenity, and security today. I am certain this is true. For today when she came into view, with her red hair blowing and her blue sweater flowing, I saw her running directly toward you. My God, my God, I thank you today, for you have let me know that our Nancy is okay. The God that I have heard and believe, you have heard tonight. And when I do meet him, and I'm looking forward to it, I know I can always face him as I face you tonight with all honesty and sincerity and look him right straight in the eye and simply say to him, to the best of my ability, I try. Thanks an awful lot. You're a wonderful audience. Enjoy your conference here, and thank you very much for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.